All right, in 8.6, talking about solving rational, well, I guess that should say um, equations, not expressions. I'm going to fix that first. Solving rational equations. Um, you know, this is obviously an important topic throughout, um, throughout algebra, right? Anytime we extend our knowledge of functions, the next thing we talk about is, well, what can I do with it? And usually what I can do with it involves some kind of equation solving. So there are two methods that we're going to deal with, um, and the first one is called cross-multiplying. And this is the one that you're probably the most familiar with. So if you've actually started to glance at the problems to the right, um, you can see that we are probably going to use this, um, this method when I have two, um, we'll say single term expressions. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and there's one on each side of the equation. Of the equation. Two single term expressions. I have one expression with a single term, right? This is just one unit. And I have another expression in a single term. As I said already, you've seen this before. Where have you seen this before? Um, if you think back to Algebra 1, and we think about proportions, solving proportions, you learned how to cross multiply, right? So I'm gonna multiply, I'm gonna cross multiply. So I would have three times x minus seven equals two times five x in my first example. I would distribute and I would solve. So x equals negative three. So let's see this in another example, just to be safe, in my bottom bottom example here, um, I'm going to cross multiply. I'm going to distribute, and so now it's just my normal equation solving techniques. Uh, I'm going to distribute, and I'm going to solve. So x equals negative one third, right? X, well, X is negative three over nine, which simplifies to negative one third. So cross multiplying, plain and simple, pretty straightforward, nothing insane. Um, you've been doing this since algebra one when we talked about solving proportions. So this is all good. Method two is the least common denominator. Um, when should I use it? I should probably use it with um, more complex or more involved equations than the types of things that I would use my cross multiplication method for. Um, so you might see multiple terms on one side of the equation. But just as everything in math builds on itself, the big tip that I have when dealing with this is to condense one side of the equation, or both if necessary. If you ever come across a problem where you have to simplify both sides, you should do it. Um, so I'll say one or both to one term. And then it's going to work just like cross multiplication. So I like to teach it this way um, for one big reason, and that's math always builds on itself. And I think a lot of times math tends to be taught as just a lot of individual subjects without explaining the tie. I think tying together the concepts are super important. So um, why am I going to teach it this way? Why do we do it this way? Um, I want to build on what I already know. So let's look at my first example up here. Um, if you've noticed, right, I have multiple terms. I don't, I can't cross multiply yet. So the first thing I should try to do 
is combine these. And we've learned how to do this, right? We need to find our common denominator, which is gonna be 2x. And I need to think to myself, so this is just like I did in 8.5 in our last section. Um, what do I need to do, what did I do to two, to two, to get to two x? I multiplied by x. So I need to do the same thing in my numerator. Then I'm gonna look at three over x and say, what do I do, what do, I do to x to get to two x? I multiplied by two, so I'm gonna do the same thing. Three times two is six. My operation stays. And now I can just cross multiply, right? And we're gonna imagine that there is kind of a division by one going on over here on the left. Oh, sorry, the right, whoa. Um, so I'm gonna cross multiply. Seven x plus six equals two x times three. So I get seven x plus six equals six x. I get six equals negative x. And I get x equals negative six. So it's just that easy. It's all I need to do. Um, and of course I could go back and check my answer if I wanted to. Let's see this one more time. I've got multiple terms here. I can't really cross multiply yet. So let's make this a little bit simpler. Let's start to combine some of our terms here. Uh, make a common denominator. My common denominator is gonna be x minus five. Um, well, this is technically over one, right? So what do I need to do to one to get to x minus five? I need to multiply by x minus five. So I'm gonna have one times x minus five, just to show it. Um, and then I don't need to do anything to eight because my denominator matches my common denominator. Um, I'm just gonna carry everything over here. I'm gonna simplify my numerator first. So I have x minus 13. And now I have a common denominator a common denominator case, sorry, a cross multiplication case. Sorry about that. I've gone from a common denominator case, like the one I've started with, to a cross multiply case, just like I have up here, where I have two individual terms on either side of the equation. So I'm gonna cross multiply, I'm just gonna move my work down here. So x times x minus 13 equals three times x minus five. This is gonna get interesting. So I have x squared minus 13x equals 3x minus 15, and I now wind up with a quadratic. So we've learned how to solve quadratics. I need to get everything over to one side first. Um, so this is where a lot of math starts to really build together and come together. All those good equation solving strategies um, that we've learned so far. So let me just bring everything over to one side, minus 16x plus 15 equals zero. I could go right to the quadratic formula, but it's easier to factor um, if I can. So let's check for that first. I'm looking for factors of 15 that add up to 16. Um, one and 15, three and five, right? So my options are gonna be, really the only option I have is one and 15. Negative one and negative 15 to be exact. So this factors into x minus one, x minus 15. And of course, if you remember, I'm gonna split up and solve, so this becomes x equals one and x equals 15. So sometimes you wind up getting quadratics, um, but we're not gonna freak out when we get to this point, when we get to a case where we have a quadratic, where we have a quadratic, because we know how to solve quadratics. We've spent a whole chapter talking about it. Um, so we're just gonna apply everything we've learned earlier in math. And that's what this is really starting to do is really combine all the things that we've learned so far. So actually just to show this one more time, let's, um, let's consider this example over here. I have another LCD case, at least common denominator case. So let me simplify this first. Again, we can kind of pretend that this is over one. So my common denominator is x minus one. Um, I don't need to do anything to this first term, which is really helpful because my denominator matches my common denominator. And then I have five times x minus one, six over x squared minus one. Uh, I'm gonna simplify this so I get 
tell from thinking here, this is going to be minus 5x plus 5. So that's going to give me 12 minus 5x. x minus 1 equals 6. And cross multiply. Oops. Okay. This is where things might get a little bit interesting. Let me foil here. Let's see. Um, well, I need to get everything over to one side, and I need to combine my like terms. So I don't like dealing with negative leading coefficients, so I'm actually going to move everything over to the right. 5x cubed minus 12x squared. Mm, losing track of terms here. Uh, should be plus x plus 6, I think. And we've got this fantastic cubic. I don't believe I'm giving you anything this complicated on the homework, but we shouldn't panic because we have tricks to solve this too. We can apply a rational zero test, All right? Just like we've learned before. I could also do this on my calculator if I wanted to, which I'm actually gonna do really quick just to um, make sure I didn't accidentally give you anything in this video that has um, solutions you can't find or find nicely. So let me just kind of check this real quick. No, okay. So we learned with our rational zero test that all we got to do is check our P's and Q's, right? Our factors of the constant and our factors of the leading coefficient. Um, again, this is just, this is the point where everything starts to come back all together. So just to kind of run through this for the sake of time, we know that my potential rational zeros are plus or minus all of the p over q's, right? So 1, 2, 3, 6, 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 6 fifths. But we should always start simple. So we're going to start by testing points just like we did before, right? Test 1. And of course, again, you could do this on your calculator with the zero function. Um, but I don't think the practice hurts to... Uh, you know, keep our synthetic division nice and fresh. And we actually come up with a zero, which is awesome. So my factor so far looks like this. Which is great because I actually now have a quadratic that I do know how to factor. I'm looking for factors of 30 that add up to negative 7. So I've got 1 and 30, 2 and 15, 3 and 10, 5 and 6. Um, and of course I know that uh, 3 and 10 positive 3 and negative 10 will work out. And this is where I would factor by grouping, right? So I would do 5x squared, maybe minus 10x plus 3x might give me the most to work with here. So if you remember from when we learned how to factor by grouping, we're going to pair off, factor out our common terms. So I have 5x, x minus 2, and 3 x minus 2. I will admit this is maybe a little more challenging of a problem than I had intended to put into this video, but I do think it's really good to show um, to show you guys how the topics that we've learned already interconnect and always, always, always come back, um, especially as you're preparing for pre-calc next year, um, to start to see how all these topics really connect together. Um, and that you'll always have these tools in your toolbox ready to use at any time. Um, so I've got my polynomial factored here, and just as before, I can break all of these up and set them equal to zero. Oops. Skipping ahead, and then solve them. So I get one, negative three fifths, and two as my solutions. So I can still get solutions here, um, I actually should go back and check because if you notice, um, if one is a zero, if I, if one is a solution and I were to test that into my original equation, right, if I were to kind of go up here and maybe I'll just copy it over so I can 
use it down here. If I were to consider my original equation, and I were to plug 1 in, I'd be dividing by 0 in a few places, and that's obviously not good. Um, so, you know, if you ever do get a whole bunch of different solutions, take a quick look at your original, take a quick look at the denominators of your original function and just make sure you're not dividing by zero. By zero. Um, but that's really not the focus. The focus is our two, our two um, methods here, right? Our, our cross multiplying method that we've learned in algebra one and our new least common denominator method where I'm actually adding the fractions together to simplify it a little bit and then applying my common denominator trick um, from Algebra 1. So these are kind of the two main types of problems that you're going to see. Um, and of course, as we see too, a lot of the math that um, you've learned throughout this year does not go away. So always keep that in your back pocket.